<coughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. There's a few people still making their way in, as I said, but we're, we're not going to delay things anymore. So, I'd just like to introduce myself. My name is Bruce Hawker. I'm the organizer of the event. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. So, um, I've been living here in the Algarve for over 40 years now. Um, and uh, I run Open Media, the, the publishing company uh, which organises this event, and we, we had the idea back in 2019 to basically stage these seminar events along the Algarve to help people who either were, were already living here or people who are on holiday here thinking of moving to, to the Algarve. Uh, but obviously Covid came along and the whole plan was scuppered, so we started in uh, April, we did the first event at the Tivoli Hotel in Carvoero. This is the second one, and then we'll be at the Conrad in Quinta de Largo in September. So, um, my parents moved here in the 1970s from the, the UK. Um, I went to school here, met my wife here. We've raised three kids here, and we've even got grandkids now. And uh, so, pretty much anything that the, living in the Algarve can throw at someone, I think. Uh, myself, along with the other speakers, will, will have experienced. So we. we we should be able to answer any um, any questions you have. Um, so, open media. Um, I've worked in the publishing business most of my life. Um, and we published the Portugal Resident newspaper and the Portugal Resident website, um, the Central Algarve magazine, um, which I launched myself 22 years ago. We also have a Portuguese, a Portuguese language week, weekly magazine, a uh, weekly newspaper, sorry. Um, Barlavento, which was uh, launched 45 years ago, where we took it over about 15 years ago. Um, before I get started, um, I'd like to just ask you all um, a few questions, because it's, it's important for us to know how everybody got to hear about the event. So if I could ask you for a quick show of hands. Um, could I, did anybody hear about the event over social media, Facebook or just one? Okay, <laughs> two. <laughs> um, did anyone hear about it online via email invitation or from the, the Portugal resident website, possibly? Okay. And um, did anybody pick up the, the leaflets, invitations that we've distributed all around Lagos over the last um, couple of weeks? Okay. Um, Finally, I'd uh, just like to get an idea of the people that are in the room. Um, could I ask everybody who actually already lives here to raise their hand if we have any, anyone who already lives here? That's great. So lots of people who do, which is good, and uh, lots of people who uh, don't and need the information. So that's great. Um, so our event partners, they're all here on the screen. You've had a chance to, to meet most of them. Um, they're in the room. So I'll actually introduce the speakers one by one as they as they come on. So I'd like to thank all of the, uh, the, the event partners who have made this possible. Um, and I'd also like to make a special thank you to my team at Open Media who have um, basically pulled, it, pulled together to make all this happen and obviously the, the, the fabulous Cascade Wellness Resort where we are. <coughs> During the seminar the, the speakers are going to cover a wide range of subjects. So we're going to start with the legal aspects of buying and owning property. Uh, then we've got um, the residential um, issues, uh, then we're going to have taxation before a, co a coffee break, then we're going to move into a quick real estate presentation, um, followed by health, uh, healthcare, um, and then uh, AFPOP, the Association of Foreign Residents. Um, so at the end of the, of the session, we will be um, putting some chairs on stage and all of the speakers will be on stage with me. And We'd basically like to ask you um, to fire any questions at us and challenge us with anything you'd like to ask us about living in the Algarve. And um, hopefully we'll be able to answer any questions between us. So um, <coughs> that, that's it from me. I'd like, like to introduce um, Dr. Preda Rosado, who's a, pro a professor of law um, at Faro University and a, and a tax lawyer who works very closely with us. So Dr. Pedro, could you please take the stage? Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm not going to thank Bruce anymore 
because he gave me only 20 minutes to speak. I'm very disappointed with that. And uh, I would like just to basically uh, cover some points which I believe are the most important ones, updated ones regarding buying but also owing a property in property, being the owner, being residents or non-residents. Uh, I know it's very short time, so what I've decided together with my team is that in our desk there's going to be just one page with full protection of data from, for your emails, where if you tick one or two boxes in relation to some of the subjects we described there or any others, I promise that I'll be in contact with you free of charge for the beginning to give you the extra information that you may need. First of all, I'm a lawyer. I'm a lawyer, property lawyer and tax lawyer. And of course, besides being a lawyer, I have a company, a tax and accounting company, also with my name, because I have family members working, working there, including my wife. We are based in Portimão, Lagos, Carvoeiro, Faro. And of course, from Faro office, we cover the other areas of, of the Algarve. Uh, and as a lawyer, some of you may ask, well, not necessarily the British, because they are very close to having their own lawyer when they decide to do an investment or a will or whatever it has to do with legal matters. But some of you from other countries like Sweden, uh, America, uh, Finland, Scandinavians in general, question sometimes why a lawyer, if we are in Portugal, should not be just a real estate broker like in America or in Sweden that takes care of everything. I used to say that in Rome, do like the Romans do. And it's a fact that the law, and Portuguese law or Latin law, uh, do not give the agents, which I respect a lot, the real estate agents, the necessary powers to cover all the process. So that's why there is the lawyers involved, lawyers, solicitors, even, involved in these kind of transactions. I think it's very important from to start that you have to choose a property. But it's very important to understand also that, and this is not because of the Portuguese necessarily, some of the properties or many properties have their own problems, which requires a clear due diligence. You may say, well, I'm buying an apartment, apparently it's built. Yes, it's a fact, but there are condominium debts, there are taxation matters, there are leaks, there are sometimes the need of surveyors. I'm not saying that and, and, and imagine, for example, a villa where the people say, I'm the owner of this land, and he starts building a pool without a permission, or a borol without a license, or an extra basement. Why? Because I'm the owner of the land, why not? And sometimes we find these kind of problems in our properties. Finding a good agent, and we have some here today, it's very important from day one. But it's very important to understand that the real estate agent which lists the property, collects some documents from the owner that sells the property. And these documents sometimes have one year, two years, are not updated because the property is still on the market. This documentation regards to be updated and a due diligence needs to be made. We have to tick lots of boxes in our due, due diligence process. The, the technical problem, well, I say it's not a technical, the, the problem that we have here all in these days is the competition between buyers and sellers and other agents involved in this. And there is a first step, really, when you choose a property that is the promissory contract. It's a contract between buyer and, and sellers where they really commit to do that transaction, to take it to a final deed, let's put it this way. And this promissory contract, despite many agents think it can be done with the template that they obtain in the internet, it's not the case requires a few weeks, sometimes two weeks, sometimes three weeks. Sometimes one of you wants a loan in Portugal and do not want to pay a deposit, to, which cause that deposit is non-refundable. And trust me that most of the sellers do not accept a clause subject to mortgage. And because they don't, we are in that position where we need to rush to complete that due diligence. The person that should do this due diligence is your lawyer or your solicitor in Portugal. Not your solicitor in the UK. You may trust your solicitor in the UK, but he cannot act here. Having said that, 
Once we sign a promissory contract, normally 10% deposit. Well, but that's when the property is ready to be bought. Imagine that it's a property under construction. And your builder now, in these days, wants to finance himself with your money. And it requires 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10. It's important to understand which builder we're talking about, which seller we're talking about. Because you don't own anything until the final deed. So it's important also to guarantee clauses like what's happening now with the rising of the prices. And now the builders come and say, the iron, the concrete is increased 30%. You should pay me also that. No. It's a fixed price that you're buying. But if the appropriate clauses are not in that contract, if it's just a template from the internet, you will face a problem. And everything is late. Due to COVID, now it's the war. So it's very important that to focus on this step, which is this promissory contract. Then after that, it's just we have established more or less the period of the deed which the buyer should control according to these expectations, organizing the monies, etc., etc. Some of you think that, well, what about monies? Shall I transfer to the notary? It's very important to understand our notaries are no longer the old notaries we had before. 30% of the deeds, the final contracts in nowadays, are done in lawyers' offices, with the banks involved and all that. Each time or the notary departments, which do not receive your money, which do not do any due diligence, which only check the number of the property, the land book of the property, the license. What license? A license of habitation. Yes, but does the pool is there in the plans? Is the first floor legal? The notary will not control that. So this must be something that must be done in advance. We don't have VAT in Portugal on buying a property. The British will understand the stamp duty concept. We have a mix of a property transfer tax and the stamp duty. All together, basically like a shark. Imagine a shark and that small fish that comes near the shark all the time. That's the two acquisition taxes. I have a table, and I will supply to you that information in detail, because a property of 50,000 euros or 100,000 euros probably pays nothing, or almost nothing. 1%, 1.8, something like that. But the property over 1 million euros pays 7.5% 7, 7 one tax, the second one 0 0.8. So we're talking about almost, almost, I would say, 9%. Never more than 10%. Why? Because the two taxes, which are paid only at the end, when you get the ownership, plus the deed itself and the registration, all these four costs involved, and also the lawyer's fees, normally tabled around 1%, VAT inclusive, not VAT inclusive, maybe a discount. This is all possible in our market. So no more than 10, but could be 3 4% on top of your purchase price. Yes, your seller will talk about furniture. Let's allocate something to the furniture, to the contents, fits and fitting. Why? Because it saves capital gains. You also save acquisition taxes. One day will bite your hands. Why? Because you have less acquisition value on your property. It's important, of course, to have a full inventory. There's no problem to buy and allocate some value to the contents. For both, par for both parties, it's very important. That's not a problem at all. As long as that is detailed, to avoid that, Mr. Seller, that has a huge television black Sony, at the last minute changed it to another Sony, but with 10 years old. They do that sometimes. So it's important to guarantee that it's necessary with some photos of the television and with some clauses that allow you to be the day before the deed or the day on the deed to check that. Oh, but you're not here. Someone will do that for you, your agent, your lawyer. Let me tell you this. Sometimes lawyers are seen as bad people. Oh, lawyers want some money. Let me tell you this. We have a, group, a good group of lawyers, property and tax lawyers in the Algarve. Not all of them. Not because they are bad people. It's because they don't know yet everything or most of the things they should do. But your lawyer, and I classify myself as in this group, is normally your friend for life. And I repeat for life, sometimes even after death, once we die and the, the spouse is there, the husband is there, the children are there. I keep a relationship with my clients for long, long periods of time. I'm the one that deals with the infiltration of water. I don't like that. Hurts my, hurts my feeling, oh, the infiltration. But it's the lawyer that five years later is there for you. 
It's not the agents, which are great people too. They sold your property. They bought your property. But then they carry on their lives. It's the lawyer. And please note, being your residents, you need to file tax returns. You need to do wills. Being non-residents, you may still need to file tax returns on your rental income and still do wills. Your lawyer, a good lawyer, and sometimes they die too. Some, I, sp I spoke with a client just a few minutes ago. He said, I don't know where he is. Why? Because there was no contact. It should have been a contact, a permanent contact, not just saying happy birthday or happy Christmas. No, a contact with correct information. This brings me to the situation of this news that we are seeing in our days. Good, good news from Bruce and team. Fake news from others. Memos from everybody. Chat discussions. The other day, and one agent is here, organized a transaction, and the buyer decided not to have a lawyer. Everything was fine. He doesn't want a lawyer, easier for the seller's lawyer. If the buyer doesn't want a lawyer, he takes everything. He takes the pro rata of the council tax. No, he pays the full council tax. Of course, until the end of the year, he'll be the owner. We don't have to put a clause that we're going to split the council tax. He doesn't know, he bites it. Could be a few hundred euros or some thousand euros. If your tax value is 500,000 euros, we could be talking about 2,000 euros. Now we are in June. This is already 1,000 euros that's going to be in the hands of the buyer. It could have been split if the appropriate clauses were there. Let me talk, let me make some reference about this news. Today we have a great news about the Golden Visa. Joking with Bruce. The other day, this, this, this client that was buying, this person that was buying, suddenly asked, he wants to rent, which lots of you, we don't, you don't take residence immediately, maybe one day, you decided to buy and then to invest a little bit in rental. And you get someone that will assist on that for you. Take the guests, clean, clean the beds, etc., etc., etc. And you get some income from that. Some of you have heard some news recently and this is disclosed in the memos, that the Supreme Court have made a prohibition for a local lodging license for habitation properties. And this gentleman, because he saw that news, and because he had nobody to say anything, decided not to buy. One of our guests here today is losing his commission. My client was selling, he didn't sell yet. Why was that? Because he didn't have nobody to clearly explain to him that a court decision, an individual court decision, will not produce effects on him immediately, more if he should have seen the parliament website, he would see that the two majority parties in Portugal already decided to move to a clarification of the law that will allow, of course, the AL license in all habitation properties. If you make too much noise, or your guests make too much noise, definitely your neighbors will complain. But your neighbors will not be able to stop you from renting your property. The memos all, all talk, you go to the Google, Supreme Court, Supreme Court. That's wrong news. It's correct, the decision, but it's wrong in terms of what it will mean for you in the future. You should have bought it safely. Well, not all lawyers knew, knew about the parliament, the parliament decision to change or clarify the law, but it's what it is. I would like to call your attention then to a few situations that is happening now in this moment, which is wills, taxation from a double tax treaties that have been eliminated, importation of cars, and some other situations. Wills. Being you resident or non-resident, you should do a Portuguese will. If you are non-resident, you will say, oh, I've done a will in the UK or so in America. You know what's going to happen? Your lawyer in the UK will know about trusts, will appoint you or your wife to be some trustees, members of the trust or the organization of the trust. When it comes to sell, he put a clause there that the trust will be valid for 100 years. And suddenly, you die, your wife will sell, your wife dies, you want to sell. And suddenly, we cannot use the, the UK will in Portugal and everything is blocked. What have you should have done? You should say, I leave my assets to my wife, my wife assets to me, then to the children, something like that, that will make your life easier. It's one of the most difficult situations. Some of you die, probably your wife, your husband wants to go away. 
wants to sell or wants to keep playing golf in Portugal, but wants the situation solved. A wheel doesn't cost much and will solve the, the situation. If you are residents, you have even a, better, a worse problem. Conflicts of laws. If you are resident here, you know that there are new regulations, which also applies to British, despite Britain at the time uh, opted out from that European regulation, basically say the following. The law that will apply to your secession, unless you choose another law, is going to be Portuguese law. And Portuguese law has forced airship. If I die today, hopefully not, my wife and my children, that they are minor, will take the, my assets in equal share. How can then my wife sell anything? She can't because she's is 13. Or she has to go to court for a special permission that takes two years. However, some of you in your own country know well that you have freedom of disposal of your assets. British, for example. English, for example. More than Scottish, but English, for example. So why not doing the right thing? A Portuguese will eventually to say, I leave the assets to my wife, my wife leaves to me, my children then, and if there are conflicts of law, we choose the English law to apply where you have freedom of disposal. Some taxation matters. I'm not going to the taxations that my colleagues from the panel will discuss later about these seven visas, golden visas, and assets. But I'd like to call your attention. We have a team in our office that deals with tax returns. Finnish, Swedish are crying all now. Oh my God, the tax treaty disappeared. Now we're going to pay twice. Most of the tax advisors do not know, most of the tax advisors do not know what a tax credit is. And the, despite the Portuguese tax, the Portuguese, uh, the, let's say, the Portugal tax treaties disappeared, our internal laws allow a tax credit that will eliminate sometimes exactly the tax in Portugal because you pay them in your own country. I talk about Finland, I talk about Sweden. Oh, but I don't have the information yet. We have to submit a tax return in June. That's what most of the accountants will say. Wrong. The tax law says that if you don't have the tax credit yet, you can file your tax return later in the year without any penalization. Another thing, fiscal representation. Not in detail, as my colleagues will discuss. None of you must have a fiscal representation, fiscal representative. Look, fiscal representative, is it your neighbor? Should be your son that lives in Portugal? Should be your cleaning lady? Of course not. But we see every day on the news, on the web, lots of companies advertising for that. And I see people biting it. How can they then discuss anything with the tax authority? How can they know in detail anything? An example, you sell your property as non-residents. Like my friend tell me, I pay 28%, Pedro. That's what is in the law. But who knows about the European court decisions from the European court that invoke the discrimination between non-resident residents? Oh, we heard about that. So it means that if you sell your house, oh, but I'm no longer in the UK, in the EU, I'm UK. If you sell your house in Portugal, if you are from America, Canada, whatever country that is not EU, you benefit from a reduction of 50% on your tax bill. But you need to do it. You need to request it. Oh, Pedro, I sold it two years ago or three years ago. And what's the problem? We can go back four years. But for that, we need to file a tax claim. And a tax claim cannot be filed by your neighbor. It must be filed by a proper chartered accountant, which is this in the most of the companies, or all the companies we have, you will speak today, and also in our company. What I'm talking about is the gain, 100% of the gain, is what the non resident should be taxed on, then 28 flat rate. The Portuguese residents will benefit from a 50% discount. So why should they benefit? Not the Portuguese people, the Portuguese residents, tax residents. And that's been decided by our Supreme Court seven years ago, and now confirmed by European courts. So this means money on your pocket. The tax man will not accept it. It's very important. He will continue, because the law was not changed, he will continue to, in, to tax you at 100%. 
But then we file a tax claim and we get the money back. I don't know if I still have three minutes, do I? One. One. <laughs> AL, AL problems, rentals. Oh, I have heard I spoke with a company that rents. Of course, it's not your lawyer that will rent your property. But they say, I need to start the activity. Yes. And you know what happens then? Pedro, I made a mistake because now I have a capital gain because I read that the capital gain is imposed. You know why? Because they tick the wrong box. When you start an activity, you should not put a cross saying that your house is like changing nature to a commercial unit. You don't need to do that. You just need to start your activity on the local lodging activity for tourists. By doing that, your capital gain will not be that capital gain that they are talking about, that they became very serious. Ticking boxes. Lots of our colleagues do NHRs like we do. Suddenly, an accountant ticks a wrong box and you get a bill of 40,000 euros. Because it's the wrong box. Because they don't understand. I'm not saying that you, you, you must look for professionals. There are lots of professionals here today. And uh, I'm not saying that we are the only and the best. Even if I can feel myself inside, I don't tell you that. But that's a personal matter. There are some of you I know for sure they have law already lawyers and accountants. And probably you are good with them. And I don't need to say some of them are really good. So that is the irrelevant. What is, I feel is important to say is that in Portugal, do like the Romans do. Choose your lawyer. Buy your property with your lawyer. Sell your property with your lawyer. Sometimes lawyers together can eliminate obstacles in the sale. The other day, a property was being sold and it was missing one document called habitation license. Sorry, technical file of habitation. Like a consumer book. Everybody thought this could be, oh, you know how we solve that? I promised to my colleague that I will give that to him in a couple of weeks' time. And this way, the deed was signed. And between lawyers, this is true. This is a word, this is blood relationship. And then the deed was done. Otherwise, the deed will be cancelled. Look, I hate this guy. <laughs> and what I'm going to ask you, to some of you, because as you could see, this is, I teach one, one hour and a half each time. Then I have a 10 minute break and then I have another hour and a half. I cannot teach in 20 minutes. He's not teaching, of course, I'm joking. I have just this small page, page outside. It's just in our desk. Name, surname, email, ticking the box information you need, and I guarantee you we'll provide that information free of charge. And then, of course, if we carry on with a good reduced fee. Thank you very much for this time. Thank you, Pedro. I'll introduce um, Shelley Wren now of the Sovereign Group, who's going to be talking to us about um, residency options and also introducing the, the Sovereign Group. Shelley. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, oh, click. Which one? I can't see. That'll do. Yeah. Okay. So better. much information. Oh, I've got to stand here. Well, there's been a lot of talk about dying up here for the last 20 minutes, but I really enjoyed that, Pedro. That was really informative. Um, I'm not going to talk about dying. I'm going to talk about um, living and how to live and how to come and live in Portugal and how we at Sovereign can help you understand residency programmes. But before I do that, I'm just going to touch very quickly. So uh, my name's Shelley Wren. I work for the Sovereign Group, uh, which is a group that operates in 26 countries around the world. And uh, we're a multidiscipline, multi-family office in the financial services world. And we actually operate with quite a number of services, which I'm going to run through quickly. Um, Portugal is our, um, one of our flagship offices. We've been operating here for 30 years and it's where we actually started in the um, early 90s here and in Gibraltar. So what do we do? Um, we help clients structure their assets. We help them understand 
that when they go and live and work and operate in different parts of the world, we help them understand how to do that. And we do it by helping them structure right from the base route. So we are also corporate services providers. We set companies up for clients. And we work both on the corporate side and the private client side. Um, we actually have a trustee business. So we offer professional trustee services. We are on what we call onshore, which is in European jurisdictions and in the UK. We're midshore, which means we operate in Hong Kong, Mauritius and Singapore. That's mainly for our Middle Eastern clients. And we have offshore jurisdictions in Gibraltar, Guernsey and the Isle of Man, none of which are any interest to us in Portugal because they're all blacklisted. Um, private trust companies, investor fund information, we work with people such as the Blevins Group who handle our clients in the wealth management space and we actually provide um, structures for pensions which are trustee services. We have an insurance division, we have an aviation division, and if anyone in the room is interested, we also have a kidnap insurance division. Hopefully none of you will need to worry about that. Um, so I would say that we are an extremely diversified business. We operate much like a multi-family office establishment. And my team here in Portugal, who are with me in the room today, um, our work with us on the fiscal side, we provide fiscal representation services, and we are a full service accountancy practice, and we actually have the subject that we're going to talk to about today, which is the area I work in, which is helping private clients with global advisory and residency situations of where they want to move and live and manage their taxes around the world. So obviously what we've got is we've got a lot of clients that um, as a result of Brexit and the Brits in the room have actually now faced problems of how to actually live and be in Portugal and actually uh, not be subject to the 90, 180 day rule. So that does lend itself to a D7 residency programme, which I'm going to tell you a lot about um, today because I think that's one that's usually the most of interest. Golden visas, we look after clients around the world, predominantly not from the UK, although they are starting to use these more frequently, the British, but we obviously, where we operate, we have an enormous amount of clients that want second passports. So we have a residency citizenship by investment division, and we allow our clients options to look at various countries around the world, and one of which we specialise in is the Portuguese golden visa. So the rights of residence for EU nationals, well, the Brits are no longer EU nationals, but what we have actually benefited of for many years is the life that the EU offers, offers us. So living and working in one of the safest countries in the world, I don't know if you know, but Portugal happens to be number three in the safest countries in the world. Uh, feel free to test me after the event as to where the first two are. <laughs> um, obviously, the European zone benefits from great value in the real estate sector. So from an investment perspective, buying real estate in Portugal still offers great value when you consider and compare to other countries in the EU. The Golden Visa obviously uh, allows travel-free travel entry into the whole Schengen zone. So these Golden Visas have been sold uh, quite prolifically on the basis of that free entry into the entire zone. Um, education, healthcare, lifestyle, another attraction as to why many like to actually go the golden visa route. And then you can apply for the passport after five years and you can hold dual citizenship and dual tax status if you desire. So the rights of residence for, e for uh, golden visas is attractive and obviously the characteristics and the unique fiscal landscape if you become resident here are attractive and um, my colleague in the room is going to talk more about the fiscal services of the NHR regime. So what we look at is the golden visa. Why has this become so attractive? I think COVID has actually made a lot of people really sit back and think where they want the flexibility to actually be um, and what many people don't really understand is that some passports are so restrictive and prohibitive for traveling and with COVID what we've seen is people actually come to us and go well we no longer want to be locked in and we no longer want to be able to not go somewhere in the event of a crisis which seemed to be coming around the corner thick and fast so it's a it's a flexible option which means you don't have to become resident the golden visa allows you the access to the country but you don't have to become resident and you don't have to be fiscally resident um, low minimum requirements, you only have to spend seven days in the first year and 14 days in the subsequent years 
to actually qualify and you have to invest in the country and there are different assets that we'll come on to in a moment. Your families are also able to be part of this application. So, you know, that's very interesting for a lot of people uh, who have businesses all over the world, can't necessarily live here, uh, don't necessarily want to, but they want to have the flexibility for their children to come and live, work and study here. Um, the passport is a big appeal because uh, if you take the South African nationals, many Middle Eastern nationals, Chinese nationals, a lot of people do want the second passport. That's not the key driver for what I'm seeing in the market at the moment. It is that flexibility of entry into the EU that I see as the main driver. Um, the ownership of the selected investments. You have a broad range of investments that you can choose when you go the golden visa route. Now, they are either real estate, which, as I mentioned, still offers great value. And obviously, when we have um, you know, great agents here like Fine & Country, um, who we do a lot of work with, they're able to actually source assets all over the country that can be linked to the Golden Visa. And these assets are um, still, in most jurisdictions around the country, still very good value propositions. So you are actually buying a qualifying investment to allow you to get the visa um, at what I consider to still be value and affordable pricing. You can invest in funds. That's a half a million euros that goes into a fund, and those funds are also into different sectors. Um, they are, in some cases, non-cyclical to the actual residential or commercial property market. And what does that mean? It means that you as an individual, when you sit with myself and my colleagues in the room, if the golden visa is the right route for you, you're able to do an assessment as to what type of investment fits your overall personal financial circumstances and the risk profile. And um, our, my colleague Gavin is the, is the gentleman that would assist with that a bit piece of work that we do together. Um, Access to the Portuguese public services, healthcare and education if you become resident here. So these visas are attractive, people do become resident with them, some do it later after they've started the process and it actually gives you the flexibility of coming in and out of the country and if you are on a restricted 9180 day inbound tourist visa then this is an appealing uh, way to actually come in and out as you please without becoming tax resident. This is the other option, and if managed correctly, particularly for those of you in the room that are from the UK, um, how many people are here from the UK? I, not so many as normal, but nice to see you. Um, we've obviously, as you can hear, I am British, we've obviously been very adversely affected by Brexit, um, um, in more ways than one, not just immigration. Um, However, what this uh, visa does is it actually says, well, OK, I've got a house in Portugal. I'm thinking I want to spend the time that I used to spend in Portugal before this all happened, and I want to be able to come in, in and out without the restrictions. So the D7 is actually a function of permanent residency in Portugal. Now, there's something you have to be careful of here, is if you go this route, you are actually then tax resident here. So it's vital that before you make a decision to go this route, you do the tax planning so that the double taxation agreements can be reviewed, your assets can be reviewed, and there is an assessment as to what it looks like if you become resident here. Some people become solely resident here and others become dual tax resident. An even more lengthy exercise and one that's really important to take seriously and work with the experts in the room. But it's very easy to get one of these visas as long as you can support yourself, you've got pensions, you've got investments, you've got passive income, you've got rental income, you have the ability show, to show that you've got savings in the bank. You prepare all the documentation, we help you get ready for that, and you make sure that those funds are deployed into a Portuguese bank account to show that you can demonstrate for you and your family that you can have these minimums of income per annum. 8,460 for the main applicant, 50% of that for a spouse and 30% of that for a child. So we do an assessment on your income, your assets, your balance sheet, and then we work out whether you would qualify for said visa. We guide you on how to make sure that before you actually come in and become tax resident here, we look at the tax efficiency and structuring part of your portfolio, and we create the bank accounts, the fiscal numbers, all the applications, and then once you've got that visa in your passport, what does that look like? Passport is issued a visa. You have four months to come in the country. 
you get two entries and within that visa and once it's issued at CEF the residency cards you then are a tax resident and we set you up at the tax office under the NHR regime however you've got to live here you have to spend six months here consecutively or eight months non-consecutively and um, lady and gentleman at the back of the room just asked me well what does that really mean if I need to go somewhere else and I break my day count well obviously the Portuguese aren't going to say well you can't go and they're going to trap you and you just got to be here but you have to have evidence of the fact that you are leaving the country for the sound reasons parents might need help you may be going to a wedding you might be going to a board meeting, you may be going to a meeting somewhere. As long as you can evidence that you're living here, you're paying your taxes here, and that when you leave the country, you're doing it for a sound reason, and you're not just coming in here on a visa so that you can get in here, become an HR resident, and carry on flying off around the world and not paying your taxes. So it's, it's, a, it's a fabulous solution, if planned correctly, for those that want to actually benefit from not being tied to the 90, 180 day rule. So, um, how long does it take? Well, um, I suppose many of you in the room all know that nothing in Portugal goes in a straight line. Um, and uh, that's the beauty of it, I think, somehow. Um, having spent 35 years in the Middle East, I'm quite familiar with um, the mechanics of how long things can take. Every country that issues a visa has a different timeline. Uh, we have been doing these now for several years and we've obviously had COVID and we've had long time lags and backlogs. We've noticed that the embassies are now improving their turnaround and D7s are certainly quicker than a golden visa, although as Pedro said, we've actually had some good news, which I think might have been prompted by um, some very good pub publicity around the fact that CEF is now functioning and allowing golden visa applications and is actually starting to up its game, shall we say. So we can actually take you through the entire process of the D7 and the Golden Visa. The timelines, we are very, uh, we set the expectations. We just don't know. It depends where you're from, which jurisdiction you're applying in, getting your documentation correct, and then it's a question of waiting. And some people in the Middle East are waiting four or five months for appointments. And then if you go into places like Singapore or Hong Kong, they're getting them really quickly. So it just depends on the jurisdiction. The UK obviously works quite well, functions fairly quickly, um, but I, I think my colleagues in the room will agree, I have actually never seen so many people from around the world moving to Portugal. So I think it's fair to say that we have to sort of be patient with the authorities because they have got a massive amount of work helping clients, uh, helping people actually move here. Um, this is a little bit about our, uh, our business. We have a, a client loyalty program, so we make sure that we look after our clients. We have a client relationship manager in-house that works and assists our clients with all the onboarding. We ensure that our clients are taken care, for, care from end to end. We work with our colleagues in the room that, don't, uh, uh, that offer services that we don't. Um, our residency programs are pretty um, detailed and we have an extensive amount of experience in cross-border planning and actually bringing clients into the country depending on their personal circumstances. So I've just been given the two minutes I'm going. Uh, our offices are in Lagoa. We're shortly opening in Lisbon. Um, my team are here with me today and I look forward to meeting you on an individual basis and asking any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Next we've got um, Gavin Scott, who is the uh, senior partner of Blevin, uh, Blevins Franks um, here in Portugal. And Gavin's going to be focusing on the non-habitual tax regime. Um, once Gavin's finished, we'll be going straight into the coffee break for 15 minutes and then, uh, then back in. So hopefully we'll be on schedule. So thank you. Go on. Chris. Thank you. 
Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm conscious that I'm now standing between you, your coffee, and a pastel donata, or whatever we have um, waiting, uh, waiting for us. My name's Gavin Scott. I'm the senior partner with, uh, with Blevins Franks here in Portugal. I've been in Portugal not as long as Bruce. Um, I came straight from school 22 years ago. Uh, and uh, I've been running yeah, Blevins Franks operation uh, here since. Um, I was listening to, uh, to Pedro and Shelley and it struck me that uh, the, the, how do we all work together and what do we do? And it struck me that Shelley and Pedro both do the doing, as it were. It's, a, it's one of those relationships, a bit like a, a, bit like a marriage, um, where Blevins Franks, we do all the telling um, and our colleagues do all the doing. Uh, the, uh, we provide all of the advice behind it and I'll give a little bit more detail um, on that. Uh, there are some numbers there, I won't run through them all. The important ones for me are the fact that we're big as well as being clever. Um, so we, we look after over 5,000 families across, uh, across Europe um, and we handle on their behalf in excess of 3 billion euros of their, uh, of their assets that we provide uh, advice on. Again, we don't do any of the doing, we're not an investment company um, per se, um, but we'll give the advice on their, on their invested uh, assets. The, um, the team here in Portugal has grown over the, uh, over the years. Our offices are in Almansil and in, uh, in Cascais, and some of the better looking ones from the, uh, from the team there are with us today. So if you've got any questions that you'd like to ask of us, um, we'd be very happy to, uh, to help. What I'd like to do is just explain uh, who we are, first of all, um, and the fact that, uh, that why I'm, able, I'm standing here talking to you about the things that we're going to talk about. Um, so we describe ourselves as, uh, as specialist advisors says confidently. Um, very importantly, all based locally. So as I said, I've been here for 22 years. Everybody you speak to at Blevins Franks will have gone through the same process that you're maybe considering yourself moving. So we quite often get involved in conversations around uh, schools in the area, um, estate agents who you might recommend. Shelley mentioned one earlier, but of course other estate agents are available. Uh, we've got uh, Casas de, de Barlavento um, with us today. Paul, good morning. Uh, you're, anybody you're speaking to at Blevins Franks will be living here uh, locally. But we're also supported um, by uh, tax specialists, and our tax specialists might be based in Lisbon uh, or, in the, uh, or in the UK, for example, and they're expert in cross-border taxation. So if you're moving here from France and you've got um, financial products and structures that you want to bring with you, or if you're coming from the UK, we can talk about that cross-border uh, aspect to all of that. Very importantly, I think, everybody that you speak to within Blevins Franks will be fully qualified and of course we're highly, uh, highly regulated. Uh, we, um, yeah, fully qualified, highly regulated. We're working uh, post-Brexit and that has given a number of complications around the cross-border issue. If you're already living here, and I saw a number of hands up earlier, you may already have had uh, letters from your financial institutions in the UK saying that they can no longer deal with you as you're no longer a UK resident. Um, and in such a situation, uh, we were able to say, well, actually, we can give you advice from the UK perspective because our UK business remains UK regulated. Our European business is now European regulated. And although it's still difficult for us in that market to, uh, to deal cross-border, we can get around those, uh, those issues. And we've been Brexit ready ahead of, uh, ahead of that happening. So for the uh, British expatriates in the, uh, in the room, we're able to provide the advice now that your UK advisors won't be able to provide you as you move overseas. Uh, what do we actually do? Um, I describe what we do at Blevins Franks as tax-driven strategic financial planning and wealth management advice. Um, and all of it really designed to deliver peace of mind to our clients. So the idea, as Pedro um, was saying earlier, making sure that you're getting the right advice from the experts in their particular field, rather than, as we would call it, um, golf club conversation and gossip and so on, uh, suddenly things develop and grow. And Pedro was talking about the uh, AI licenses and people suddenly hearing things from other people or reading them and misinterpreting them. Make sure you've, you've got full, uh, full grasp of all of the facts really before you start to make um, your decisions and that way that will give you peace of mind knowing that you're always doing the right thing. Those that haven't uh, are already here, we'll go. Uh, where's, uh, where's Adriana? Adriana, can you maybe click me forward just on 
we'll go on manual. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, those that are coming, uh, those that are already here, welcome to Portugal. Another one, please, Adriana. In fact, if you just keep going. Uh, one of the things that Portugal, one of the problems that Portugal has is with 10 million of a population, less than the uh, population of Greater London, if you like, um, children are growing up, they're going to universities, more and more they're going to universities overseas, um, liking what they see there, staying there, and there's a little bit of a brain drain in one respect, but more importantly, it's a population uh, that is decreasing. We're uh, not procreating at the same rate. Um, I can't take any responsibility for that these days, that's in the past. Um, maybe some in the room could, uh, uh, could help us with that. Uh, it's a, there's, a, there's a drive on to, to increase the population here. And so as a result, what Portugal says is, um, come to Portugal uh, and attract you in, and they attract us in through some of the uh, tax benefits that are on offer. The one that you'll have heard of is very, uh, very commonly um, talked about, the non-habitual residence regime, and I'll just talk briefly about what it is and maybe give some examples later on. The Portuguese have said, look, come with high value occupation jobs, uh, accountants, doctors, dentists, uh, come to Portugal and we'll give you an attractive tax rate for 10 years. We'll cap your earnings while you're in Portugal at a maximum of 20%, uh, and we'll do that for 10 years. The idea originally was to encourage companies to come and do research and development here, you know, high tech companies. And they said, and if you've got one of these high value occupations, we'd like you to come to Portugal and we'll help by uh, reducing those tax rates. They also then expanded it and said, actually, if we can do it for, uh, for people coming to work, why don't we do it for people coming to retire? And originally it was extremely attractive. They said, in fact, if you've got um, pension income coming from overseas, um, we won't tax that at all. If it may have been taxed in the country that it arose, we won't tax it here in Portugal. It will be exempt for a period of 10 years. Two years ago, uh, because of pressure from uh, other parts of the EU and so on, they said, well, okay, we have to have some form of taxation, and it's now taxed at a flat rate of 10%. So still extremely attractive to encourage us to come into Portugal. Thanks, Adriana. Post-NHR opportunities, people say, well, Gavin, that's great. There are some great opportunities to be tax exempt during that 10 year period. But what happens after that time? Actually, there's a lot of planning that we can do using the 10 years that we have. And the fact that actually Portugal, if we set out our stall in the right way and we plan our assets correctly, can be an extremely tax efficient place anyway. Uh, Portugal, for example, unlike some of our uh, Iberian neighbors, no gift tax, no wealth taxes, and importantly, no inheritance tax. A small stamp duty on the transfer of assets, non-family assets, uh, that would be paid to change the title of those assets, but in general, no inheritance tax. So very, very friendly. So what's the catch? My grandmother used to say, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. What's the catch? The catch is, as, as uh, Shelley pointed out earlier, we're looking at the number of days that you have to spend in Portugal and the tax consequences of, uh, of being here. We need some planning around the capital gains tax elements, the inheritance tax elements, the uh, income tax elements, and make sure we've got those planned correctly. Because it may be that we've got to consider whether we've actually left our home country originally. So for example, if you were coming from the United Kingdom, we have a statutory residence test there that could mean that depending on the ties and connections that you have, you might spend just 90 days in the UK and the revenue there deem you to be tax resident in the UK. But you're spending six months in Portugal, so all of a sudden I'm tax resident here and there. Fortunately, there's a double tax treaty that kicks in to deal with that, and we can talk people uh, through that. But just being aware of the idea that just because you've become tax resident here doesn't mean that you've shed residence in your home country. And the other aspect to that is that people say, oh, well, that's great. There's no inheritance tax in Portugal. That's great. But if you're still UK domiciled, then that inheritance tax liability from the UK may still follow you. So a lot of planning that needs to be done around that. Take advice early. One of the things we do at Blevins and Franks, we call it a strategic financial plan, is to say, if you're moving jurisdictions, let's look at where you are, let's look at where you want to get to, and what are the things and the timing that you need to do on the way there? So making sure we get them at the right time. As Pedro reminded us earlier, there's no point in coming back to a lawyer after the event and saying, oh, why didn't we do this or why we didn't we do that? Because it would have put us in a better position. So we will give you a roadmap that will guide you through that, uh, through that process. It might help if I give you a little bit of an example. 
Um, I'll speak very quickly about Mr. and Mrs. Green. They're coming from the, uh, from the UK. Importantly, they've got a company that they hold uh, shares in that work a family business that they want to eventually pass on to their children. They've got some pensions, they've got some savings. Um, and what does that look like? They sold the property in the, uh, in the UK and bought their villa uh, through Casa, Casas de Bar Levento, as it happens, uh, for, uh, for a million euros. They kept the shares in the company and we're going to do some planning with them over the 10 years of, of their uh, non-habitual residence. They'll continue to take salary and, uh, and dividends from the company. However, what we did was we increased the, the dividend take and decreased the salary. On their salary, they're paying tax uh, here in Portugal, but on the dividends, the dividends, because they may be taxed in Portugal, can be taken as disregarded income in the UK, and under the non-habitual residence regime, they re receive those dividends exempt from taxation for the 10-year period. So we're going to use that as part of our, uh, our planning process. Yeah, that, uh, that exemption gives us that 10-year uh, window. We then looked at the pension planning from the UK, and I know not, not everybody was in, uh, put their hand up as having come from the UK, but we also deal with a lot of people, um, Scandinavians, uh, Northern Europeans, who've spent time in the UK and may have UK assets and things, particularly pensions if they're working for multinational companies. So the pension considerations were along these lines. When they're moving overseas, why would you move and not bring your goods, chattels, um, and assets with you. So a lot of people think, oh well, I'll, my pensions are fine there, we'll leave them back in the UK. But actually, you might want to consider taking those assets with you. Why? George Osborne in 2015 introduced a thing called uh, pensions freedoms. Today, if you have a UK pension, you can draw it down as quickly as you like, you've got access to it in all sorts of different ways. They called it at the time, I don't know if you remember, they called it the Lamborghini budget. Everybody thought the, ever, that you'd be cashing in your pensions and going out and buying fast Italian sports cars. In reality, the acceleration was in tax collection, not in any cars that you might bought. Um, it meant that instead of spreading your pension over a number of years and collecting the tax over that time, the government got all the tax money up front. Um, so what we said here is, if we thought you have all of those freedoms, how do you lock them in? I apologise if I'm speaking awful quickly. Come and catch me later if you've missed anything. Uh, how do we lock all of those benefits in? Well, you can take your pensions overseas, and now you have all those benefits, and they can no longer, they cannot be taken away from you. So, with Mr. and Mrs. Green, we considered whether that was uh, whether that was appropriate. One of the considerations, and people often say, "Oh, Gavin, I've been told my UK advisor says because I'll be paying 10% income tax in Portugal, I should take my commencement lump sum in the UK before I leave." Part of that roadmap. Sounds good because 25% of your pension commencement lump sum uh, will be free of tax in the UK. So no tax rather than 10%. However, with Mr and Mrs Green we discussed the fact that what we're doing there is we're taking that 25% lump sum out of an environment that is inheritance tax friendly and we're putting it into our own estate for inheritance tax purposes. So while we might be avoiding 10% at the outset on the income, we could be costing us 40% if something was to happen to us in the meantime before we spent that money. So consideration, and I can't say which is right because no answer is correct for everybody, but you've got to go through that process of thinking about it and you have to have thought about it before you cease to be UK tax resident. On the pension, as we draw it down, the pension um, under NHR will, will only pay 10%. So again, that gives us the ability, even if we don't need it, um, we'll consider drawing down all of the pension during that, uh, during that period because we might fund other things that become more tax efficient after the 10 year period. Pensions in particular, specialist area of, uh, of expertise, so you really want to make sure that you have somebody who's suitably qualified. Personally, although I carry a high level of, of qualification and regulation, Pensions isn't my specialist subject, and so I bring in pensions experts from within Blevins Franks um, to ensure that you've always got the right experts dealing with the element of advice that we're, um, that we're giving. The additional planning that we ran for Mr and Mrs Green, uh, we uh, gathered the ca their excess cash together from the UK savings. UK savings, ISIS and so on, tax efficient in the UK, not tax efficient in Portugal. So we gathered that together with the excess that they had from their house sale. Um, and what we did with that was we put them into a Portuguese qualifying life policy, which at the end of, the, of each year, they take to um, sovereign their accountants, they take one piece of paper that details everything that's happened within their investment portfolio. If they've had nothing drawn down from it, there's no tax on the rolled up income and gains, so they've gone back into a very tax efficient 
uh, environment there. And very importantly, the tax on profits that they draw in later years, the tax on that reduces after five years and eight years. After eight years, they're only paying tax on 40% of the rate. So instead of, say, a tax rate of 28%, it will be closer to 11% tax that you're paying on any gains that you defer the payment of tax for to the future. <coughs> um, they might decide to draw their pension at a faster rate and add the pension proceeds, because they don't need them now, into this vehicle that will give them greater tax efficiency in the future. So they're looking and saying, well, that's great with my pension. I've only got this 10-year window. Let's, we may, on certain occasions, decide to use that window uh, to create long-term tax benefits. In summary, um, loads of opportunities in Portugal from a tax perspective, but the timing is critical. You've got to make sure that you have that roadmap and you do things in the, uh, in the right order. Um, you can take advice from our website. Um, I say advice, you can take some guidance. We've got uh, tax downloads and so on that, you can, uh, that will give you an idea, uh, both around the uh, taxation in Portugal and the visa position. As, uh, as Pedro mentioned earlier, we all have the ability to take your email addresses and so on, and we can send you out informative uh, e-newsletters. Um, we are not a sales uh, organisation. We won't be chapping on your door uh, and chasing you down to say, you know, why haven't you come in, uh, to speak to us? Let us know how you would like us to contact you in the future, the kind of information um, that you would like to receive, and we'll send it by, uh, by e-newsletter. We also produce a book, Living in Portugal, and within the book, you, uh, you'll have all of the tax uh, rates and guides. If you provide your name and address to Ionella or Dion, the back of the room, they'll be on our stand and they'll be happy when the new edition 10 comes out, they'll send you one with our compliments for attending today. Um, we won't make any charge for it, I think normally the cover price of £7.99, £9.99 or whatever it is, um, but we'll send that with, uh, with our, our compliments if you'd like to leave your name and address. Thank you very much for being with me while I ran through uh, quickly. If you'd like me to go over that and again, I'll be on the stand in the, uh, in the other room. Thank you very much. Bruce. Bruce, uh, Open Media and the Chamber, thank you very much for having us. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Bruce has said, Paul Cottrell from Casas de Balavento. We're a real estate company. It's been established for uh, over 20 years now in the Lagos area. Uh, we've got offices uh, in Lagos, in Luz, in Algezur, and also in Alvor, uh, close to Portimao. Um, Casas de Balavento, uh, what do we do? Simple, what it says, property services for Western Algarve. We sell, we build, we clean, we maintain, we manage. But what I'm here today uh, to speak to you about is the nice bits, the smiley bits. Why do we buy in the Algarve? Why has anybody bought in the Algarve? Primarily, it's uh, a choice of, I'd say, because I think Shelley said in the, in the first session, Portugal is rated third safest country in the world, and the countries that she was looking for were uh, New Zealand, <laughs> New Zealand and Iceland. There you go. I say, saved your job for later. 300 days of sunshine in the year. Okay, we've had a, a couple of years where we might have not met that, but a couple of years where we've also increased on that as well. That's very, very appealing to a lot of a lot of people, not just from the uh, the UK, from Northern Europe, especially Scandinavians. They like to come here through the winter time and then go home for their own summer time. The country is very steep in culture. The, the history of even just Lagos itself, as well as many areas across the Algarve, uh, is, it's, it's, it's amazing, it's stunning. And if you do have time and if you are living here already and you have managed to jump on a train either from Lagos or from Tunes and shoot up to Lisbon or up to Porto, the history in those areas also is just fantastic. But Lagos itself holds such an, amount, an immense amount of, of history itself. And it's, it's worth looking into when you get time uh, and, and come down to the town and, and check it out. It's all about quality of life. And, and we, we're all here for a reason. We've all moved here. I moved here just over 20 years ago. Um, primarily my background was uh, Majesty's Forces. Um, but I actually come here on the back of, uh, I was a rugby coach and uh, I'm now a rugby coach of Lule, um, uh, which, which is down the other end of the Algarve. But rugby brought me here 20 years ago and, and I've stayed here ever since. Now a family and uh, uh, growing up and leaving the nest and going to university and all the other things that, that the children do. Um, so it's all about quality of life and, and that's what myself and, and many of you 
have made that decision and reasons for why you've come here. The friendliness of the Portuguese people, always willing to help, apart from Pedro. Because <laughs> Pedro, no, I'm only joking, Pedro, I'm only joking. Fantastic lawyer, very, very good. But the, the Portuguese people, um, are very different to, I think we, we touched on it on a previous chat as well, um, some, of them, some of our Iberian neighbours. The Portuguese culture, the people are always wanting to help. They're always listening. They're always willing to do things for you, go beyond. You may not get it done straight away. You may get it done the next day, but they're always willing to help. But for me personally, I've, I've tried Spain, I've tried other areas, and, and there's, there's nothing, like, nothing like the Portuguese people themselves. The food. Mm -hmm. Yes. Me and Bruce, look at us. <laughs> we like our food, don't we, mate? We do. Food and wine in Portugal, fantastic. Not a, never had a, a, a bad meal, never been to a bad restaurant. Yes, what certain places you go to can be a little bit on the costly side, but again, venture. Travel to those little areas just outside the villages and the towns. You'll find some amazing restaurants. And that also is, is a point where in the UK or in Ireland or in America or in, in Sweden or in Denmark or wherever you're coming from, yes, the prices, the cost of living is rising. Yes, the cost of living here is rising. But you're still going to go out and you're going to have fantastic meals, lunches, dinners for a pittance of money in comparison to what you would be paying in your home countries. Lack of congestion and pollution in the area. For me, when I first moved over here 20 years ago, I got into my car for the first couple of days and I thought something was going on around the area because there's no cars on the road. No traffic jams. Go to the traffic lights, one car waiting to go through, tra to, through a traffic light. Again, this is one of those quality of life aspects that you may have lived in London, you may have worked in some high, busy cosmopolitan areas throughout the world that you're living in congestion is taking you an hour, two hours, three hours to get to work every day. Here, stunning, absolutely amazing. The motorway is in place now. When I first came here, it was only built maybe a third of the way along. So then you had to come back onto the 125 and travel along on the 125, which yes, took a little bit of time, but we get there in the end. Now the motorway is open all the way across from Tavira, all the way through to the end of Bensafrim here. Airport, 50, 55 minutes, hour, really, if you get caught up in a little bit. But again, it's uh, something that's drawing people into the area. Beaches and marinas. All the beaches and the marinas across the Algarve, stunning, absolutely stunning. Living on, living around, being within minutes of a beach or a marina. The Algarve is 187 kilometres wide. It's about 12 kilometres deep. So for every five minutes, less than that, from Sargwesh Tip all the way across to Tavira, you're passing beaches. You're passing a golf course. Golf courses, 36 of them at the moment in the Algarve. You'll pass a golf course every 10 minutes. So again, quality of life again, it's there, it's on the doorstep. If you want it, you can, you can have it. English widely spoken across the Algarve. Um, I, um, I heard somebody mention earlier on that uh, whenever you go out and you're trying to learn Portuguese and you want to speak to the Portuguese and they speak to you back in English. Well, they're more interested in speaking English back to you than what you're wanting to speak Portuguese to them. But try, keep on trying. I've lived here for, for over 20 years now. I'm fortunate that my wife and my children, they all speak Portuguese. I let them do all the talking and I just sit there smiling, eating, drink. So they, they do it all for me. So I'm the lazy, I'm the lazy one in the family. But uh, whenever you're out and about, they're there, they'll do it for you. Very polite, hospitality is amazing. The knowledge that agents within the Algarve when you're due to buy, the larger agents, ourselves, uh, Bruce's company, many other large establishments throughout the Algarve, they're, they're regulated. Um, and that's a positive point, why? Because when you're actually looking to, to purchase, if there's anybody in the room today that hasn't purchased and they're wanting to purchase going forward, be assured that they are through IMPIC, okay? That they are covered, the, the uh, real estate company is covered legally as well as yourselves when you're going forward when you're buying, because you don't want to get caught out at anything at all. And if you're not sure about it, speak to Pedro, because Pedro will give you advice. Am I right, Pedro? Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. So the buy-in process, guys. Um, me, myself, um, I, may, I may be proven wrong uh, from other people, or, or uh, Pedro might have something to, to ingest into this, but 
It's one of the easiest ways to purchase in Europe. The Portuguese way of, of purchase, um, for me, I, I think it's, it's stunning. Um, we go into uh, what we call a promissory contract, which is a legal binding agreement between both parties, usually backed up by the way of um, lawyers on both sides. Some people do decide not to use a lawyer because they think they're saving money by doing it, but they're not doing themselves any favours whatsoever. They need to have lawyers on both sides of this, these agreements. But the way of buying through in Portugal, once you've signed that promissory contract, you are legally bound in with the seller and it does prevent um, any disgruntled agreements or disagreements from happening. Um, so usually, nine times out of ten, that sale will move through the process from start to finish. It's a chance to work close and personal to your agent. Okay? The agents we have, uh, I've got nine, nine salespeople within the company, uh, within my company, and um, we all become such close friends. Uh, the relationship there is with the buyers from start to finish. It isn't a point where you come along, you say, I want to buy that, we sell it to you, we mediate, because we're not lawyers, we're the real estate agent. All we do is we mediate between both buyer and seller. We then pass it off to the legal entities and they deal with all the bits and bobs from their side. But once you've done that, we don't just walk away and say, right, that's it, guys, on your way. We don't want to see you ever again. Okay, I, I have relationships with clients that I've sold 15, 16, 17 years ago still that are still living here and enjoying life. And I think many other of my colleagues within the office have done exactly the same. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a chance for us to, to become personal, available for you 24 hours a day and, and, and to do a lot of the things which you really don't want to do. But one of the most important things that we feel, uh, which is changing as the years go by, is the preparation before traveling to the Algarve. If you've come to the Algarve with the knowledge that we've got a certain, certain amount of money to spend, and that's all we want to spend, but we want this, and we want, we want a castle with 10 bedrooms, with this, with this, with this, and you've got a small amount of money to spend. Well, your expectation is going to have to change. Why? Because you're not going to get a castle with 10 bedrooms and all these other rooms for that amount of money. So as time's gone on over the last year, two years, and, and, and you might think that's a bit weird because we've been through this horrible COVID situation. Well, I can tell you now that the process has gone out through the roof over the last two years um, through this COVID period where now it's a point of we do have to change our expectations a little bit we do have to when we come in what can we afford to buy with this amount of money well maybe we can afford to buy that now but we'll go for this one which is maybe slightly less than what we were looking for but this is what we can afford to buy that's what's happening now throughout the Algarve and throughout Lisbon the cost of the cost of per square meterage now has gone up significantly throughout the Algarve as it has maybe two or three times in Lisbon. Okay, so what we were able to buy five, six, seven years ago, not a chance, not a chance. Are we gonna go back to that again, what we were five, six, seven years ago? Don't think so. So we just have to be a little bit more open about what our expectations are. Do a little bit of due diligence, do your homework on where do you wanna be? Do you wanna be in Quinta de Lago? Do you want to be in Villa Mora? Do you want to be in Albufeira, Carvero, Lagos, Sagres? Pick that area. Help us to help you. Because at the end of the day, we're the ones that want to make it, make it happen for you. We're the, ones that, we're, we're the ones that want to sell you the dream. Okay? These are the dreams that you've been working for all of your lives. That you're now either moving from your countries, coming over here to live full time. You may be looking for a second home, a holiday home. Okay? So do a little bit of homework prior to doing it, if, if you are. M maybe the majority of you are already homeowners here, and you're here for the advice for my other colleagues. But for the ones who are still not purchased or wanting to go into it, just do a little bit of due diligence. Do your own little bit of homework to help yourself, to help us. The variety of properties to choose from, okay? Opportunities now, they're becoming a little bit more littler, but they're still there, okay? They're still there. If we, we as a company, as our company at, at Barlavento, um, we're now at the stage where you tell us what you want, we'll go and find it for you. Our portfolio is, is, is coming down significantly, but we will still go out and find it for you. All agents that you work with, guys, 
If you want them to find something for you, you say, this is what we're looking for, this is what we're after, this is what we want to spend, get them to go and find it for you. Okay, let them do the work for you. At the end of the day, no, you're not paying their wages, it's the sellers that pay the wages. But this is what you want, your expectations are this, let's go and do that and make life a lot easier for yourselves. Nice thing is over here, no chains. Okay, we don't get chains. And for, and for the people in, in the audience that, that don't understand what I mean by that, is that in the, in the UK especially, I'm, I'm from Wales originally, but, and don't hold that against me by the way, but when you have a chain sale in the UK, it can go drastically wrong. You may, you may say, yeah, we love this house, we've made an offer, it's been agreed. But that person needs to sell and they're buying somebody else's house that needs to sell, that's buying another house that needs to sell, that's buying another house. You could have five, six, seven, ten people in the chain. One, piece, one person fails in that chain, that's it, your sale's gone. Over here, it doesn't happen like that. Okay, the quickest time that we've ever closed a sale here in the Algarve is 24 hours. 24 hours from start, from sign, deed, done, everything's all in order. Okay, so it can happen if you want it to. All right, so not having a chain is a massive thing. A variety of buyers currently finding it a little bit more difficult to get that perfect place to compromise. Okay, we've talked about it. Reduced time frames to purchase. Again, it can be very, very quick or quite slow. A lot of the Portuguese properties now that are being built, as you've seen around the areas, whether it be this area, central or, or down in the east, a lot of them are coming in with solar energy, solar panels. Um, Portugal's making a massive, massive push, which is fantastic to see. The wind farms are there. The solar panel farms are there. We're, we're really trying to sort out the sustainable energy. Energy certificates for the properties that you're buying, okay? Again, another major point within Portugal. This needs to be in place prior to you buying. Don't be just buying a property, oh, we've got an energy certificate, oh, yeah, but it's, it's down in E or F. Be aware that if it's an E or an F, it's got a few issues. Okay, you need to look at these properties and make sure what are the cavities like, what are the insulations like. There are things that we need to look at going into this. So again, as agents, we look through this, we'll check it through for you. If you're unsure about anything, you speak to the lawyer, your lawyer will advise you accordingly, okay, because they are also looking at your interest as much as what we're trying to protect your interest as well. Surveys, engineer reports, don't be afraid to ask that, okay, don't be afraid to ask that, it'll happen. If you want them to go and do a survey, they're going to do a survey for you, for peace of mind. Not a problem with that at all. All different nationalities of buyers are coming through, right? Everywhere. Gone the years by where it's mainly UK, Irish buyers a lot in the Algarve. Now it's a multi, 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 multi nationality country. <laughs> Americans coming in, Germans, Chinese, Russians, French, whatever. They're all coming in and they're all purchasing here as well. And the nice thing is now as well, of course the agents, the agents don't just, like, we don't just speak English, we don't just speak Portuguese. I think in our company alone we have, I think, 10 national languages that we're able to speak. So members of my, my team, they can speak the English, the Germans, the French, uh, the, the Dutch. The, it, it can be done. And if we, if we can't do it, again, we'll get somebody in that's able to, to translate and to do things for you. So summary of this, guys, because my time's up, is your quality of life is what I think personally is buying in the Algarve is that's what it's all about is the quality of life it's a signature away but please make sure your lawyers are the most important people here okay the relationship between you and your lawyers is the most important thing here but at the same time if you ever get told that you've got commissions coming from a sale on the board earlier on Gavin I want the commissions that you told me I was going to get earlier on right that 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 sale from I haven't seen anything of it yet. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> we're very, uh, I'm very pleased to have with us today uh, Dr. Maria Elise Sarandi Silva, who is um, one of the most highly regarded medical professionals, I would say, in the Algarve. So, <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Maria Elise, please, please. Uh, she's actually hurt her knee, so. Um, she's going to have to sit down for the presentation and, uh, and needs some help up onto the stage. Hello everybody, good afternoon. And first of all, I want to thank Bruce for inviting me, giving the chance to be here with all of you. Um, I'm really an old doctor, that's the truth, he said the right things. And I fell in my own house and injured my knee, so, so let's talk about health. Health is an enormous challenge of a subject. 
because with health, we have to consider that health is the most important thing in a human being's life. It makes all difference, all the big difference. And who am I? Let me introduce myself. I'm an old doctor, an old family doctor, who loves new things. In old times, when I was younger, people around used to call me Dr. Spitfire. But I'm still a dreamer, always in search for excellence. I finished university in 1968, so you can see 50-something years. I'm a consultant in family medicine, and presently I'm general manager and clinical director at Luz Doc International Medical Service. I'm also an administration assessor at Group HPA. So what's the role of healthcare services? Healthcare services are here, exist, to resolve health problems, like the deficient health conditions that people find, or doctors find, and that brings the health needs need to be sorted out. Because if you have a health condition, you have health needs, which is the difference between the good health you would like to have and the problems that you have at the moment. The world is definitely changing, and the responsible for this has been the COVID pandemic that has shown the vulnerability of the healthcare systems all around the world. Now, I have these two slides, this one, the next one, about the good quality of the healthcare in Portugal. And the last week, lots of problems came up. The state hospitals are in a terrible state without doctors, uh, without nurses. I think that it has to do with the fact that a lot of people, of the workers, were already tired from the whole pandemic and they, they, are, they cannot do anymore at the moment. So they are starting to rest a bit. And what happens is we have emergencies without doctors, we have emergencies that have closed, but I hope this will be solved soon. Because in a general way, Portugal has a good quality of health care in the state health service as well. Private and public sectors. In emergency ambulance, use you work well, but at the moment, you don't have enough people as well, which is a problem. As you can see, there are different criteria of assessment and different studies that were made, but Portugal has ranked very highly in most of them. As you can see, I went to check about this, this is the next slide I was talking about. It's a little bit out of the actual situation. But we have good standard hospitals, worldwide considered standard hospitals, in all the areas of, of Portugal. And now let's go to an interesting thing. I found a site when I went to see about insurance companies. The, one of the most important insurance companies in the world, International Citizens Insurance, that is a provider for international health insurance, has a list of the best hospitals in Portugal for expats and visitors. And I went to look in the Berlavento area, and we found Hospital Particular do Algarve Alvor, Hospital de São Gonçalo de Lagos, and Luzdoc, which, although not a hospital, they, put, they wrote that. The Hospital de São Gonçalo de Lagos, unfortunately now, has, been, has passed to the state and is not working still in any condition. It's going to be organized. But the São Gonçalo clinics are not now opening. There's already one open, and the next one will open shortly. Now let's talk about the health care in the USN Algarve in the National Health Service, the SNS, Serviço Nacional de Saúde. It works only for residents. You need to register. And there is one good thing, that emergency treatment in Portugal is available to everyone, even if you're not having a residence. Dental care is not covered. And then you have the outpatients, the two different sites where you can go. Outpatients as the Centre de Saúde, the health centres, where they do consultations and treatments, basic support, and then you have the hospitals in the area, which is Lagos and Portimão. Unless for emergency treatment, it's needed a referral from a Portuguese state doctor. And now let's go to the private sector. From small clinics and individual consulting rooms, in the last few years we have changed a lot. And we have now well-structured private healthcare services. 
self-financed by service rendered, which is a guarantee of quality, because if you're not good and you're not working well, you won't have clients paying, and though you don't work, you have to shut up your doors. Then, in between the ones in the area, we have my clinics, Luzdok and Medilagos, which we are outpatients, but we do a lot of things that you're going to see a bit further on. And we have the group HPA, with outpatient clinics, the new ones in Lagos, and hospitals, which is Alvor in this area. This was the first hospital for the group, and I was involved in the beginning of it, 28 years ago. And it was also the first private hospital in the Algarve. There are other smaller facilities around. But the, the idea of the individual consulting rooms, that's, that's completely gone. It's important to have an idea of the differences in between the private and the SNS systems. In the private, we have faster access, less waiting lists, or none. You can choose your doctor, you can choose where you go. You will certainly have more attention time. The languages, you can choose several languages, and there is a more personalized care. Of course, there is a difference. You have to have a health insurance policy, either if it is private health insurance, or travel insurance for non-residents, unless you want to pay directly. I moved to Praia de Luz in 1983. 39 years ago, everything was absolutely different. There's nothing compared to what we have at the moment, in any way. Things have changed, but for the better. Luzdok and Medilagos, from 1983 to 2022, have changed, because Medilagos only came up later. Surgery in 19, 1983, I had in Luz a surgery with two rooms. In 1994, it turned into a company with the name of Rushdok, and we had 12 rooms. In 1996, I had my first resident nurse, Nurse Nikki Medlock, which I think some of you might know. And Dr. Joanna came in in 2001, also my first resident doctor besides me. And we had then 17 rooms. In 2014, we opened Mandy Lagos in Lagos. And presently, we have five family doctors, six nurses. We open nine to seven. We have 24 hour service. What do we do at our clinics? We do a comprehensive outpatient family medicine care. That's the, the best way to say. We do consultations and home calls. We have a point of care laboratory with immediate results. We have medical specialties, aesthetic medicine, personalized physiotherapy, one-to-one -one physiotherapy, occupational health, sports medicine, which nowadays it's not just sports medicine, the right thing. It's more exercise medicine because it englobes the sport support and also the support to improve and treat and help treating other health problems like heart problems, for instance. And we have nutrition, pathology, acupuncture. For specialties that we do not have in our clinics, we use the group HPA and for inpatient care, of course. I went to have a look at my old mission statement, considering I would have to change a lot of things, because this is our business philosophy, our principles and beliefs. And when I looked at my, what I did 20-something years ago, I didn't change a word, because it's, it's still the same thing. We are definitely tailor-made health providers. We take health in the broadest sense of the word. We respect the right of everybody to be a unique individual. We welcome you to guided personal responsibility for your health, not just doing tests and giving prescriptions. We care for your health as a whole using a comprehensive, multidisciplinary approach to healthcare. We always try to follow the state of the art in conventional medicine and organize anything your health requires. We are here for you. So, everybody wants to be at their best. To be at your best, you have to do good prevention because that means good health. And health is not an end, it's a resource for everybody to live better. And a healthful lifestyle provides the means to a full life with meaning and purpose. 
So, I would say that take care of yourself, take care of your health, prevent rather than treating, and enjoy life in this wonderful environment that we live in. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting us again to, this, uh, to the second of the seminars. Thank you to you all for coming. I start this with a piece of bad news and three pieces of good news. The bad news is I am a disaster with technology. So all of this that you've just seen there might all go to whatever you want to say very shortly because I am rubbish with technology. In fact, my IT supervisor, when I ring him now, he doesn't answer the phone. He just comes to my office to see what I've broken. So this could go wrong. But the three bits of good news is I'm the last person who's going to present to you. I'm going to be brief. And I've got a video. See, it's broken already. How it? <laughs> Hello, welcome to AFPO. 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 Any questions? <laughs> um, essentially, AFPOP is a citizen's advice bureau for paying members. And that needs to be updated because now we actually have 9,000 members. And we do send a regular update magazine six times a year, 75 bulletins, you can read the rest of it. We also have much language uh, spoken, much language spoken. Okay? We have many languages spoken in the AppPop office. We have obviously English, we have Portuguese, we have German, Dutch, French, Swedish, Danish, bit of Spanish, and one of our team members is from Yorkshire, so we also speak Yorkshire in the office. For those of us that are e by gumming all over the place, we can speak Yorkshire, we can understand you. Um, AppPop has been around since uh, 1987. And in that time, we've serviced the needs of over 36,000 members. Um, we have a management council. We are not a board of trustees or a board of investors. We're a non-profit association. And since 2010, AFPOP has been a public utility or an organization, Utilidad Pública in Portugal, which means basically not that we can sell gas and electric, it means that we are recognized as being publicly useful 
by the Portuguese government. We're very proud of that because we were the first non-Portuguese organisation to be awarded that distinction, so we're very proud of that. Um, and so what do we do? As I say, we're a, basically a citizen's advice bureau. And for a small amount of money each year, we help you make sure that you get the right information uh, when you need it. And in fact, before you know that you need it in many occasions, my colleagues here on the, on the panel, on the other, my other presenters, many times you will, you, throughout, the year, throughout your life here, you will have to have their services on many occasions. But sometimes there are lots of things that you can do for yourself, and we're here to help you make sure that you know what those things are. We're help, here to help you get through those little bureaucratic, um, those little bureaucratic hiccups. And then when it's time for you to speak to one of our professional colleagues, most of these we, we work with as part of our uh, Advantage Directory, we'll, divert, we'll advise you to go and speak to them so that you'll then get the best professional advice. But there are many things that you can do for yourselves. And what we try to do is we try to stop our members acting on rumours and misinformation. Um, my wife used to have a real problem when we went out for dinner because or lunch and I'd often hear somebody saying oh yeah what you should do is you should go to so and she'd see the look on my face and say no 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 don't go and I'm sorry but that's not right you know because you hear so much rubbish being spoken by a misinformation being spoken by people who a either haven't kept up to speed with the changes to the law or b telling people things that apply to them but don't actually apply to the people that they're talking to or have just basically got the facts wrong or talking to be to seem important and there are lots of you hear lots of that around you hear lots of people giving misinformation somebody said to me recently but everything's available on the internet now well it is but what is right on the internet and what is to use mr trump's uh much used phrase now fake news how do you discern what is true on the internet and what is what is false what has been made up what is hyperbole what has been exaggerated well we're here to help you try and wade your way through that and we're trying to tell you in plain english or plain french plain german plain dutch whichever language you want it in exactly what the changes to the rules are and how they apply to you because acting on misinformation has got many people into some pretty dire uh, dire straits and then you'll end up going to the lawyers we were talking about earlier on you go to the lawyers after the after you've made the mistakes rather than before you actually need the pro get the correct information so we're there to give you the correct advice the correct advice initially and then you can go on speak to the lawyers um, with armed with the correct the correct advice we organize social events we organize social events through a team of area event organizers those people give up their time freely uh, we do give them a little bit of assistance with their expenses, but they give up their time freely to organise events for you all to enjoy. And um, they're, they're organised across the, across the Algarve and also now in Porto. We're hoping to have someone in, the, in Cascais in the not too distant future. So that's a good way, if you're just moving to Portugal, it's a good way for you to get to know people in your area, to get to know people who know about your area and who are facing the problems in your area, who have faced the problems in your area that you're about to. Um, and so that's they're always uh, it's also nice to meet like-minded people and to hear a bit more about other people's um, experiences we were talking earlier on about getting around Portugal getting around the Algarve and seeing various uh, various other places and expanding your horizons it's very easy once you move to Portugal or move anywhere I suppose to just become isolated in that little area that you've moved to but there's so much to see and our area event organizers organize events and trips that help you to do that uh, and then we also have our our second biggest member benefit really is our advantage directory and that is a directory of over 400 benefits for members ranging from everything from um, money off in a restaurant up right up to the big one that we got with our, our alliance partner who's here medal insurance which is the private medical insurance um, it's a group insurance scheme and it's uh, it's extremely cost effective it's extremely well run and it's uh, it's a benefit only to afpot members but there are also other many other in, uh, many other money saving opportunities within the directory which help you to save money on your everyday expenses so that's the three things that we do really we organize we help with information and support we organize uh, benefits uh, social events for you to enjoy and we'll, we also negotiate member benefits on your behalf which helps save you money um, 
Our office is in Portimao, but obviously everything that we do can be done by internet and by telephone. We have a website, www.afpop.com, and if you want to take the information leaflet from the desk outside, it gives you more information about what we are as an association. Um, thank you for your time. I don't want to take up any more of your time because it's fairly self-explanatory what we do as an organisation. So, so, so thank you very much for being here. Thanks for your time, and I think we're going to have a question and answer session now. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Thank you.